The circular scheme or plan brings each district closer to the central dome, which contains the medical, food, shopping, everything else that people need. The circular arrangement makes it easier to operate using far less energy than any other system. And if you start at one end of the city and go through the city, you always return to the same place. Whereas in a linear city, you go to one end, you have to backtrack to get to the same point. So the circular scheme is by far the most efficient. And when cities are contracted in the future, they will be contracted as a whole, as an entire system. In that way, all of the parts and components would be delivered in stages, like sequel one will be the underground, the heating system, the electric generators, the piping systems, the recycling systems. Then after that, the next layer, which would serve as the first layer that contains the architecture, the foundations for all the buildings, and after that, the erection of structures up from the foundations. Starting with the central portion of the city, working its way out to the different radial sectors, and then out to the final housing sectors, and then to the agricultural belt, and then to the recreation areas. The cities themselves are prefabricated. Most of the elements that comprise the structures of the cities are interchangeable, interlocking. They are designed so they can be disassembled just as they were assembled. So the new cities will be updated continuously. As the waters are piped into the cities, they are checked. And to whatever extent contamination exists, the water processing plants evaporate the water, recondense it, and cleanse it. In other words, all waters piped into the city will be monitored constantly, not by a monitoring system, but several monitoring systems. The same is true of the air above and around the city. It's constantly monitored. All of the rooftops are photovoltaic. All of the skin, outer skin of the building, converts solar radiation into electrical energy. As we move beyond the third sector, we come to tennis courts, parks. Beyond that is the residential district, which consists of lakes, waterfalls, all kinds of beautiful plants throughout the area. And each house is concealed by plants, so you can't see another building. Some people prefer, as in the next sector, to live in apartment houses. The apartments have drama groups, recreation, swimming pools, discussion groups, and so many other facilities. The disadvantage of living in a private home is you would have to go to the various places to access the same things. Instead of motor vehicles in the city, all transportation is carried on by circular conveyors that we call transveyors. They move radially, circumferentially, and vertically. They serve the function of elevators, buses, conveyors. But if you wish to go to another city, you can take an elevator down beneath the central dome, which has maglev trains, etc., that will transport you to the center of any other city or any other region. There will be no waste products, just as in nature there are no waste products. All materials that we would formally call waste would be recycled and converted into new products. And that when the city hits a certain number of people, we stop the development and let everything go back to nature between this and the next city. It doesn't mean that we can solve all the problems. We can just design and build a far better environment to advance all human beings. It is now possible to accept this challenge of designing our future if we have the courage to examine newer directions for solving our problems of energy, hunger, pollution, and war. It is entirely possible to develop non-polluting, renewable energy systems to operate the entire country and still maintain our natural surroundings. 
This could be accomplished by harnessing the sun, the tides, the wind, the Gulf Stream, and other sources. Another possible development is the building of a land bridge or dam across the Bering Strait, which would bridge Asia and Europe with the U.S. This could generate enough power to eliminate much of the suffering and scarcity of the third world countries. Eventually, with the advent of clean fusion power, we could easily propel our world's technology for the next thousand years. In the Venus Project, priority will be given to the development of these clean energy sources. There are many other possibilities for developing photovoltaic systems that generate electricity while at the same time harness the currently unused radiant heat energy from the sun. Roadways, rooftops, and many other surfaces could be designed to collect and store the heat from radiant energy, which could be used for heating or cooling. At present, our planet is our only sustainable environment, and we must protect it for ourselves and generations to come. The technology and resources are available today to translate the aims of the Venus Project into a working reality. We are tied in with nature and all of the environment surrounding us. To negate or neglect any part of that would be damaging to ourselves and our own lives. What the cities would look like? They'd look like houses immersed in lovely gardens with streams and waterfalls and flowers and all of the things that we picture that we can't have. And your home would be designed in a manner different than any process today. You would be sitting in front of a hemisphere and you say, I'd like a home of about 3,000 or 4,000 square feet and it would appear. They say, no, no, slow, more curvilinear and you get more curvilinear. Then your wife says, don't you think that the kitchen is a little too near and the kitchen is moved while you're talking? It understands language. And then you'll see a balcony extending over a lake and you'll see a building occur in front of you. And your wife might say, gee, how about another three feet on that balcony? You know, and it extends and you say, that's what I want. Then you pull out a blueprint. You see, no more, I'm an architect, I'll design the house for you. That's not for you. In other words, this is real democracy. This is where you participate on the human level. Now, of course, your children have a separate section in the house. Of course, the toilet bowl is too big for them. They fall in it. They can't reach the sink. The electrical outlets are dangerous. It's like you living with a batch of giants. So the children's sector, everything is reduced, and it's changed as the children change. If this isn't love, warmth, and humane, a lot of people think that the Venus Project is a technical project of computers and scientific equipment. No. All scientific and technical equipment, to me, is so many millions of tons of junk, unless it enhances the lives of people. We came here in the early 80s, and this land was a flat tomato field. There was no water. There were no palm trees. We planted hundreds of palm trees, and we made a little paradise here. We put up new buildings, waterways, lakes, flowers, fruit, vegetables, growing on the land. We laid out this land to show what the outskirts of Jacques cities may look like. We have a wide variety of animal life. We have alligators, deer, otters, raccoon. We have owls and many different birds. This is a migratory path for birds. And we have these dome structures. One of the students said, well, I don't know if I want to live in a dome. You're always in a dome. Your brain is in a dome now. It's the most efficient shape that evolution has evolved. A dome is strong. In a hurricane, you lose no shingles. It is fireproof. You have no termite sprays. Termites break their jaws chewing on a concrete dome. So you don't have all the problems that you have. Look, the environmentalists say, stop cutting down the forest, but 90% of them live in wooden houses. So if you stop cutting down the forest, 
Let the forest be and use concrete. Look at the Sahara Desert, all the sand and silica you can use. We've got enough building material without touching nature. We can do all that, and we can do it fast in our time. The proposals of the Venus Project range from cities in the sea to space stations. These cybernated space stations can provide the facilities of a gravity-free research environment. They can be entirely automated and will be capable of maintenance and self-repair. Along with satellites, they could serve as nodes in a major worldwide telecommunications and control system. They would also provide up-to-the-minute information on Earth's ecosystems, the position of ships and aircraft, and all other pertinent information. They will also be able to pilot and guide aircraft, ships, and other transportation systems to their destinations. Out of space, we can do a lot of new chemicals, new drugs, new metals, new furniture. We can design universal things. We can't do that on Earth as yet. We might be able to do someday when we create artificial gravity. When we're able to do that, we'll create a condition of non-gravitational field. They will differ from today's space stations in that all of the experiments in space will be conducted by remote control from a replica on Earth. This will eliminate the life-threatening danger of transporting humans into space. These satellites can also, with great precision, manipulate huge machines on Earth, which will dig canals, operate automated farming, plant crops, manage sea farms, monitor weather conditions, and much more. Outer space can be used to monitor the Earth. With the Earth turning underneath the space station, it can monitor every continent. And by using infrared cameras, you can photograph plant diseases all over the world, the Amazon jungle, Africa, all over. All that information can be concentrated in whatever lab needs that information. The lab doesn't have to ask for it. Further exploration of the new frontiers of space will provide us with bountiful resources and endless possibilities. What is a resource-based economy? I'm sure you've all heard about it. But a resource-based economy is entirely different than anything that has ever existed in the past. Most decisions were made by kings, politicians, statesmen, but nothing based upon resources. To better understand the meaning of a resource-based economy, picture an island somewhere in the South Pacific, and you want to know, you really want to know, how many people can that island support and to what degree can the extravagance of the island be maintained? First, you have to know how much wood there is, how much water, how much arable land. Once you do a survey of the resources of that island, that can best be the method for determining how many people it will support. If the materials do not exist, you can only design a culture based upon the materials that do exist. You can only grow food based upon the arable land area and the water surrounding the island, the fish, crustaceans, all the other things. And if you have an ag agronomist on your island, or a series of them, they can advise you as what is best to grow in that tropical region. So you really need technical competence in order to arrive at decisions that make sense. You cannot arrive at decisions that make sense by consensus, by asking people what they want. You have to find out what the island has to offer. And that's what you can determine the future by. All other systems will fail. Politicians have opinions about everything and information about nothing in particular. Therefore, you understand that the decisions are not made by the majority of people, they're made by the majority of people that have technical competence, that have information in the areas you wish to excel in, and methods of scientific scales of performance. If you have a million sincere people 
that have no technical competence, I can assure you nothing can be accomplished. So you have to ask the questions, can we build a society of sustainability? If you have no information as to the availability of resources, you cannot undertake such a project. Suppose you have a shortage of resources. That's the function of research labs, to make alternative materials that will substitute for lack of materials. Technicians do not tell you what to do or how to live. They merely carry out the function of designing elevators, transportation units, bridges, housing systems. They do not tell people what to do, what to think, or how to live. That's a, that's a mistake that most people make. They think that a resource-based economy has technicians that also tell you what lifestyle to use. No, they don't. The resources determine that. All that the te technicians do is build a system that can utilize those resources for the benefit of all the people involved. It has to be global. If it's not global, if you have most of the resources and most of the building equipment and most of the automated machinery and most of the arable land and most of the drinking water, Countries that do not have that will attempt to invade your country and take what they need. Every nation wants a piece of the pie. Keep that in mind. So to the degree that you try to live a sustainable life to yourself will not work because other nations that lack material will invade you. In the rebuilding of cities throughout the world, you have to consider how far those cities are from resources. That means available materials, concrete, steel, reinforcement, etc. If the cities are near that source, then it becomes more efficient to design the cities as systems operations, meaning that the city itself must meet the needs of the people that live there. We announce on television what is available and what is not available at the time and when it probably will be available. So the public has information of where to go to access whatever it is that they need. So people will have access to more things than they've ever had in a monetary system. More things and more opportunities will be available. All of the cities are designed to utilize a minimum amount of energy for maximum service. In that way, we can serve energy so that we can handle more people. There are people throughout the world that do not have access to high energy systems. We'll be able to provide more for human need if we use efficiency. Naturally, if we fail to do that, you can only take care of a limited amount of people. The resource-based economy has millions of slaves, but they're machines. And machines do repetitive, boring, and dangerous jobs. That's what the machines are for. They're not to put you out of work. If they can turn things out faster than you, we don't need you working. In fact, we don't want you working in an industrial plant. We want you to go back to school and study whatever you're interested in, whatever you think you'd like to study, whatever you feel you'd like to understand better. Unfortunately, money doesn't represent things in existence. If you set a value on every tree, every inch of arable land, all the water, and you printed money proportionate to the resources, so that the money represents resources, then it can have meaning. But today, that is not accomplished. Although they may tell you that uh, demand will really bring about these things. No, demand doesn't bring about the things available resources do. And if money doesn't represent available resources, it has no basis for social management. When you live in a false society that bases its wealth upon money, then that society itself will collapse eventually, not because I say so, because it's not based on physical reference. In a resource-based economy, 
where production and automation can turn on more goods and services, there's no need to use money anymore. If you really wish to put an end to war, poverty, hunger, territorial disputes, you must utilize all the world's resources as a common heritage of all the world's people. Anything less than that will remain with the same problems that you've had continuously for centuries. Now you have to consider what I'm saying. The reason nations invade other nations is because of scarcity. When few nations control most of the Earth's resources, you've got to have territorial disputes. No matter how many treaties you sign or laws you make, if you don't declare all the Earth's resources as a common heritage of all the world's people and bring all the separate nations together in one unified system, there is no solution other than that. And this is why we recommend the resource-based economy.